Okay, good morning. My name is Frank Sacco, and I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of Memorial Healthcare System in Broward County. I want to first uh, commend the first panel for, for its invigorating discussion and thank this panel sponsor, Ernst & Young, for its, uh, its sponsorship. This session will explore how insurance companies are strategizing to comply with the new regulations. It will examine the role of health care exchange and response by employers to the Accountable Care Act. Our panelists, and you can see extended bios in your, uh, in your handout. First we have Karen Ignani, the President and CEO of America's Health Insurance Plans, the National Trade Association representing the nation's health insurance industry. Ann Phelps, who leads the healthcare practice at Washington Council, Ernst & Young, and we have the privilege to be moderated by our president, Donna Shalala, who, as you know, was also former Secretary of Health and Human Services in the Clinton administration. Let's greet our panelists. Thank you. We'll start with uh, Karen Ignani. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here, um, first of all, from the standpoint of the climate. Anybody coming from the East Coast today is it's a breath of fresh air, and it's wonderful mm -hmm. to be here. But that's not the reason that any of us came. We came for Donna Shalala. And the gusto, which, you know, I, I sort of feel like been there, done that, because the guys made the point. But just stay with me for a sec. The gusto that all of you see here at the U, uh, on behalf of your uh, wonderfully energetic uh, president, Donna Shalala, is exactly what we saw in Washington during her tenure as Secretary of Health and Human Services. We also saw not only gusto, but we saw heart, we saw equanimity, and we saw fair play. And for any of us coming from Washington today in these times, those are the qualities that all of us uh, respect and we treasure and we love. So on behalf of everyone in Washington, you'd hear it from <laughs> Democrats, you'd hear it from Republicans, you'd hear it from Independents, and anybody else who hasn't really declared that Donna Shalala <laughs> is the real thing. So <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here with uh, Donna Yu. We have uh, 10 minutes, uh, which is very uh, challenging in terms of the topic that we have been given. So I'm going to put my watch here so I, I'm also very careful about not exceeding time and also making sure you have plenty of time to ask questions. What I'd like to talk about this morning is through the lens of health plans, not only how we're preparing for the ACA, the new market, uh, new opportunities, new challenges, but I'd like to start um, through the lens of affordability. And the reason I want to start there is that whether or not we are successful in entering this new world, and I don't mean simply health plans, but I mean providers, hospitals in the audience, physicians in the audience, consumers, employers. If we are to be successful in getting people into the system, the crucial thing is going to be affordability. And that is determined by costs. So that's where I'd like to uh, uh, start. Because unless the system is affordable, then people won't participate. If people don't participate, then we will be destined to repeat what happened at the state level. In every case, states that passed market reforms without having everyone participate what happened in every case, including Massachusetts, the first time around, not the second, but the first time around, what you saw was tremendous increase in costs, people not participating, and major, major problems in terms of the market and market dysfunction. Nobody wants that. So I want to start this morning by talking about affordability, talking about cost, and I want to specifically talk about the policy conundrum. The policy conundrum with respect to cost containment is my cost containment is someone else's revenue reduction. We do not talk about that in the public policy community. We must. Because unless we really internalize that and think about how to address that from the standpoint of each and every stakeholder, we're not going to be able to make progress and we're not going to hit an affordable system. And I think that to begin, 
the lesson of what we've seen now over years in the healthcare community. But as we look forward to the new payment arrangements that Mark and Chris and Pat thoughtfully talked about, is the promise of how can we find a direction and a path to progress. And I think it means ditching the old payment system, yes, saying that very directly. We can't build, we can't get there from here building on an old-fashioned fee-for-service system with the wrong incentives, an incentives to do more and to charge more. And in the healthcare reform discussions, I think one of the major issues, Pat probed this question of, you know, if you can look back and some of the things that should have been talked about, one of the major challenges in the health reform discussion was there was an association of costs with premium costs. But premiums reflect what we are being charged. That's how we build premiums. And we haven't had the discussion about unit costs. That's the problem, ladies and gentlemen, the system today. It costs too much. What we are being charged in the health plan community, we hear from hospitals, next year, 10% increases, 15% increases. We see specialty drug prices soaring. You put all of that into the pot, and you have premium increases that are unsustainable. So we shouldn't just focus through the lens of premiums, we need to get in under. The reason that in the policy community we haven't gotten in under that is because it is one of the hardest things to do to deal with that principle of my cost containment is someone else's revenue reduction. But there's hope. In the health plan community all around the country and certainly here in Florida, wonderful representations of that which you've heard this morning. What we see are changes on the supply side to the economists in the room and the demand side and they're working together. On the supply side, moving from a retrospective payment system to a pro, uh, excuse me, prospective payment system. Moving toward medical homes and incenting physicians to partner with health plans, with their patients to detect disease at its earlier stage, to prevent catastrophes from happening, and to move toward a more prospective payment system. We're talking about and we're seeing bundling, not just for hips and joints, but now in cancer care and a number of other conditions. Hospitals here are working with health plans. Physicians are working with health plans in this state to pioneer new payment systems. And then also, Hospitals and health plans are working together to look at global payment systems. Again, prospective versus retrospective. And health plans are designing benefit structures that incent that. Mark and Chris talked about tiering, and Pat did as well in the Part D program. We're importing that technology now into basic major medical systems so consumers can have transparency about what works and begin to make choices that are appropriate for them. What works, how much it costs, where the best care is, and that will not only deal with quality improvement, safety improvement, cost reduction, but it will also begin to shrink variation, another challenge in the delivery system. In terms of our health plans, in addition to pioneering new payment systems and bringing those not only to the commercial population under 65 to employers and individuals, but also to public programs by managing duels and improving their care to people who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, giving them a better way to deliver health care, Medicare Advantage, which is a big part of the Florida market, uh, but also um, giving individuals options that they want and partnering with many of you in the audience from the stakeholder community on the provider side. That's the new story of health care. In addition, the health plans have, since the day the health legislation was signed in March of 2010, our health plans have set up special units, any one of the uh, my colleagues here in the audience will talk about this, interdisciplinary units to make sure we were ready to do what was expected of us, which is quite considerable. So all over the country, health plans have been um, pedal to the metal with respect to what do we need to do, how do we need to provide the best advice and counsel to the regulators crafting um, the regulatory architecture, how uh, can we identify things ahead of time that will minimize disruption, improve affordability? And that's what we've spent the last almost two years doing. And on, but on the other hand, at the same time, as we look forward to 2014 
beginning, and Pat got to this in his questions, we're also seeing some challenges. And that's I want to focus on in the few minutes I have left. There, are, there is always, with any endeavor, there's a concern about unintended consequences. What we all hope is that we can bring people into the system. Unless we are able to do that affordably, people won't participate in the system. So now what does it take to get people into the system affordably? I think there are a couple of things that we need to think about. We need to look at this through the prism of where people are today. So 10 categories of coverage, important benefits, without a doubt. Any of us who don't have them want them. Those of us that have them want to keep them. No argument. The question is how we go overnight from where people are today in the market. Individuals in the market, there are 18 million of them buying individual health insurance coverage. Going from where they are today to the new market, what today they're buying is high deductible, catastrophic coverage to protect their families from medical bankruptcy. They don't have 10 categories. So they don't have those numbers of categories horizontally and they have very high deductibles. So you have to broaden the benefits and you have to reduce the deductibles and co-insurance. Mm -hmm. Now again, from a patient perspective, important benefits, but the question is how do you get there in one fell swoop? That's what we're paying attention to. There are a couple of provisions in the legislation in terms of how do you begin to make it affordable? One, and it's gonna strike you as very wonky, but there's a ratio of what health plans charge older, individuals to younger. We do this in life insurance, we do this in auto insurance, and generally you're paying according to your risk to ensure that people with the best risk get into the pool. In the legislation, that ratio shifts from where it is now, which is generally five to one, six to one across the country, that ratio, it shifts overnight to three to one. And all of you who remember your high school math know that that compression overnight it's not the compression itself, it's the rapidity of the compression overnight means that there's going to be much more pressure on younger and healthier. And I don't mean just people in their 20s. I mean people in their 30s and early 40s. That's why we need to pay attention to this issue. It's called rating band compression. We think that you can do something to transition and keep uh, the ratio at a level that's closer to where we are today. Again, remember, the principle of starting from where we are today and getting to the new market. Second, uh, I think that generally what everybody in this audience would agree with is that you want to look in any bill you get at costs that make sense versus those that don't. There's a federal sales tax that was added to the cost of the legislation that means individuals families buying coverage next year are going to spend an additional $300 to pay that sales tax. It's going to go up to $500. That's going to make no sense to individuals. It's not going to make any sense to employers, small employers. So that's the sort of thing that we want to focus on again now, and we're asking Congress to focus on that before that goes into effect and before we have an affordability issue. And then I talked also about the um, the essential health benefits, important benefits, but how do we get people from here to there? And I think that um, there's been a significant, um, very thoughtful effort on the part of regulators to look at all of these issues, and we've been very much focused on that in our job in the health plan community as we build programs and premiums is to identify these specific areas, and I know that we're going to be talking about them. So a final comment. I think as we, as I was thinking about the last um, discussion with Chris and Mark and Pat, and I'm thinking about our discussion, Donna, it struck me that there are five policy discontinuities that we should be paying attention to because it relates to this affordability principle. First, the lesson of the discussion over the last couple of years is that premiums don't equal cost. We need to get in under the hood. We have to solve the unit cost problem, what is being charged. We've just released an out-of-network survey today, and the numbers of uh, what is being charged, individuals who are going out of network uh, by providers who are out of network versus in network is eye-popping. Two, affordability is not equal to subsidies. Subsidies are an important part of affordability, but I went to school on scholarship, and I was very grateful for that. But my scholarship helped me, it's analogous to the subsidies. It helped me uh, get through college, no question about that. 
but it didn't necessarily do anything to reduce the cost of the college tuition. And we need to get to that point where we're looking at total costs. Cost shifting is not cost containment. So the silo by silo approach we've had in the policy community, here we're gonna do something on Medicare, we're gonna do something on Medicaid, then it gets shifted to the private sector, shifted to the private sector. Employers are worried about being able to sustain coverage. Individuals are worried about being able to purchase it. And public programs are, are worried about being able to maintain. ACOs do not equal competition. We've had a marvelous discussion in the policy community about creating ACOs without really getting in under the hood to look at what are the competitive effects, what are the market effects, and how do we begin to unpack that? And we need to be thinking about that. And averages, finally, for all of you um, here at this wonderful institution, as you well know, are, are not, don't give you a sense of what particular individuals will pay. So when we see the idea of increases will be an average of X, that doesn't tell you what will happen to a 25-year-old. It doesn't tell you what will happen to a 32-year-old. It doesn't ha tell you what will happen to a 54-year-old. And we st have to start looking at case studies to understand the differential impacts so we can answer Pat's question, how do, what kinds of actions should we be looking at now to be able to transition to this new market, to create affordability, and to move the system forward? That's, I think, what the discussion all of us want from the health plan community. We're very excited about the, having that discussion with regulators, with legislators, but we, the time for that discussion is now. So I look forward to Anne's remarks and look forward to uh, Donna's questions. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Karen. <laughs> Excellent. That was great. Good morning, everyone. So, well, I'm very happy to be here, too. I'll, I'll add mine, too, on this very powerful pan panel of women. So, you see how the women did, the men did. We'll see how we did. All right. Um, I also come from Washington. And, you know, in 25 years in Washington, and we learn our whole time there, we always have to be politically correct, right? We, all, we have to be politically correct. We have to be very careful. Except for when it comes to basketball. Now, I will tell you, I have to start a little bit with basketball, too. Now, I will tell you, I come from the land of the other University of M, which is, I live in Maryland. So my family, we are big, you know, here we go, Terps, University of Maryland. My husband is still getting over the loss of Gary Williams, and now we're moving out of the ACC, and it is just, it's devastating in my family. But I have to tell you, we all watched the Miami Duke game. And the only time my 10-year-old son is allowed to use bad language in our house is when it comes to Duke. So we are right there with you. And uh, we were jumping up and down. And yes, not exactly politically correct. But it's OK. It's basketball. We love it. Um, I may have to move back into ACC territory soon. So I may be down here in Florida sooner than you think. So my job today in 10 minutes or so, and I am going to try to really keep to that, is to talk to you about the Affordable Care Act and its impact on employers, companies, businesses. What did this law do to that segment of in, in our country because of the impact on business from a cost perspective and how employers provide coverage? So I think it'd be worth just, just spending a minute to say, why is the impact or how does the impact of the ACA affect large employers? And it's important to understand we hear a lot, and we've heard a lot this morning about sort of our Medicare and Medicaid programs, which is our federal programs. But there is a major engine in this country for private sector care, private sector coverage, and that is the employer-based system. We still have close to 160 million people that receive health care coverage through their employers. So what that means, if you are a young student or a student about to graduate today, when you go out to look for a job, the first question you'll ask the employer is, you know, maybe what am I going to be doing for you or, you know, what's my salary? Let's be honest. What's my salary? What am I going to make? But pretty quickly, a second question you're going to ask that new employer that you're about to go work for is, what are my benefits? Do you offer me health care coverage? What is that health care coverage going to cost? Do you offer me a retirement plan, pension, benefits? You're going to have a conversation about, the job I'll be doing, what are my wages, and what are my benefits? 
So employers have been doing this historically for decades, decades and decades since, since post-World War II. Employers got into the game of health coverage for a lot of reasons. We ne it was out of necessity. It was out of competition. It was to have a healthy workforce, making sure that individuals were healthy and could come to work every day. And yes, I do come from the accounting firm of Ernst & Young, so I would be remiss if I didn't say there are tax incentives, and you heard them, you know, Mark and Chris reference that. There are tax incentives and tax reasons why employers offer health coverage. Employers get a major tax deduction for offering benefits to their employees. You as an employee, if you are a part of an employer-sponsored plan, that benefit that is offered to you is excluded from your income. So there's a great deal of incentive. We are the only country that does this. We have a robust private system fueled by employers and it's also part of our tax code. So how did the Affordable Care Act change that? Why are businesses reacting, to be candid, not well in some cases? Well, I think it's helpful to step back and just for a minute talk about what were the primary goals? What was the major goal behind the Affordable Care Act? The primary goal behind the act is to expand coverage, health coverage, to almost 32 million Americans that had been previously uninsured. So how is that new set of 32 million uninsured Americans going to come into the system? And it's really through four ways. One, the much talked about individual mandate. Every individual in this country, with some exceptions, come 2014, has to purchase health coverage of some sort or they may face a tax penalty. Number two, you've heard a lot about these health insurance exchanges or the marketplaces. These were provisions set up in the law for states to step in and establish what's called these exchanges, a place where individuals can go and shop and purchase coverage. For lower income individuals, you've heard a lot about subsidies and credits. For lower income individuals under this individual mandate and through these exchanges, the federal government will give tax credits and tax subsidies to help them purchase that coverage. Number three, the expansion of Medicaid. The federal state program primarily for lower income Americans to, to for coverage. And number four, the employer mandate. This idea that large employers of a certain size must offer coverage to their full-time employees in a certain manner under certain new standards or they might face tax penalties. Now, all of this is linked together because if the employer doesn't provide coverage or they don't provide coverage in a certain way, their individuals may be able, or their employees, you may be able to go to these exchanges and purchase coverage or potentially get credits or subsidies to do that. And that's when the employer may be on the hook for a tax penalty. All of these provisions are linked together, the mandate, the exchanges, Medicaid, and the employer pieces. So what was the employer reaction to this employer mandate? Well, to be candid, not so great. Employers have always offered benefits in a voluntary manner. They've always said, here's to whom I'm going to offer and here's what I'm going to offer and I'm going to control that, the offer of coverage, the benefits I offer and what, to a large extent, the premium cost is going to be. The law has a lot of new definitions in place and has a lot of new requirements for how this coverage is offered. So first of all, under the definition of the statute, it says that every large employer must offer coverage. Well, who is a large employer? Large under the statute is actually pretty small. The definition is if you have more than 50 full-time equivalent employees, you have to offer coverage or face this tax penalty. Well, what is full-time equivalence? If you're a small employer, and I've talked to a lot of small employers, you could have as, you have to do a calculation. You could have as few as 20, 25 full-time employees, but you also have to add up those that are working for you part-time or seasonal workers, and you do a calculation to figure out if you bump out over 50. I personally kind of call this the small employer fiscal cliff. You have to be careful. If you bump up over 50, you have to be prepared to offer coverage or face a tax penalty. I've talked to a lot of mom and pop shops, running coffee shops and donut shops and hamburger joints saying, wow, so this law applies to me. Yes, it does. Another critical piece is a large employer has to offer coverage to their full-time employees. Well, how, to, how is a full-time employee defined? A full-time employee is defined as an employee that works on average 30 hours per week per month. Now, even my 10-year-old son to me said, geez, mama, that does seem kind of low. You work a lot more than 30 hours a week. It's kind of a low standard. And it is. The incentive was to, if we lower the full-time definition to 30 hours a week, more people will be given coverage. 
Well, that might be the case in some instances, but 30 hours is a pretty low standard. It's not the standard most employers use if they've been using an hourly calculation at all. Most employers, full-time, if you think about this, what was full-time? 32, 35, 37, 40. So employers have to make a decision. Do I expand coverage or do I reduce hours? What about the unintended consequences of a lot more part-time workers in this country working 28 hours a week, lower wages, no benefits? That was not contemplated, but it is happening. I've talked to several cab drivers and restaurant workers, and every time I, I walk into a retail store, I think, hmm, how many hours a week do you work? I ask those questions. I am a health policy geek. So, but once you figure out I'm a large employer and I'm going to offer coverage to my full-time employees, what does that coverage have to look like? Well, there are new standards of affordability to, to what Karen mentioned. It has to be affordable to those employees. It can't exceed a certain amount of their household income. So employers have to figure out, hmm, how do I create a standard that makes it affordable? I don't know my employee's household income. I have to figure out, how is it affordable to my full-time employees? Because if not, they, again, they might be able to go to the exchanges and get tax credits, and I may get a tax penalty. It has to meet minimum value standards. The employer has to put so much into not only the premium cost, but also what does that coverage look like? You can't ask an employee to pay too much in deductibles or co-pays. So all of this goes into the system to figure out whether an employer is gonna offer coverage or not, and when they do, what do the standards have to look like? It affects everyone, small employers, medium-sized employers, large employers, whether you're running a big bank or whether you're running a coffee shop, whether you're retail, whether you're a restaurant. If you can think about the millions of companies, particularly that have high turnover or low wages, they're really having to take a hard look at this. But the law is not black or white, and you hear a lot of media messages, and you're going to hear a lot more of them about well, why don't employers just drop coverage? Number one question I get after the repeal question, is the law getting repealed? No. The second question I always get is why don't employers just drop this coverage and pay what is, it's a $2,000 penalty times their full-time employees. It's so much cheaper. Why don't employers get out of the game? My answer to that is I really hope that does not happen. I really hope employers don't get out of the game and even if they think they're gonna get out of the game, they're not because employers will never be out of the game. They are the engine in this country. If all employers drop coverage, that $2,000 is not going to stay $2,000. If your employer has been contributing 15 or 16 or $17,000 to your coverage, what's gonna happen? Well, I would like more wages, please. That $2,000 is not gonna fuel the system. Cost will go up, but the employers will lose control. So I always say, if you want control over your employers or employees, the benefits that you're offering, and what you're paying, you should stay in the system because you'll never be completely out. It's also, and I would also be remiss coming from an accounting firm, saying it's not just a math equation. We're at school. It's not a math equation. Yes, you know, the, deduct the deductibility of benefits, you have to take that into account. The loss of the $2,000, sure, per employee. It's complicated. At the very least, it's complicated math. Wages have to go up. It is not a simple take $2,000 times every full-time employee. But it is also not just math. We all study art and science and medicine, too. There are a lot of reasons why employers offer coverage to their employees. Competitive reasons, I want to retain a healthy workforce. Employers have put a lot of time and effort into making sure, wellness programs, making sure if you're at risk for heart disease or ob obesity, that they're helping to take care of you. So it is much more than math. It's complicated math and it involves a lot of other subjects, too, that we all study. It's not an easy answer to just say, I'm going to drop all my employees down to part-time. Two part-time jobs for everybody doesn't work. You can't put everybody at 28 hours a week. It doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for them, employees will be unhappy, you will not be able to staff your store, your company, or your business on thousands of 28 hour a week workers. Not an easy answer. Now I do hope that, that, that Donna, the president, will ask me what, what words would I change in the statute, because I will give an answer, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold off on that, because I have two word changes, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer that if pressed. Um, but this is having a major impact on businesses, small, medium, large, of every industry and every in sector. It will have an impact on you. Whether your employer offers you coverage or not, at what levels, and is it affordable, and at what hours you work. This is affecting millions of Americans, having significant impact on our workforce. And I hope that we're able to achieve, and what we do is work with employers to say, let's think about the creative ways you can stay in the game in a good way for you and your employees to have a productive workforce. The last thing I'll say is, is we're going from zero to 60 because this law has been hotly debated, as you know, but it is here to stay. These insurance exchanges open up in October of this year. 
All of these new provisions, the mandate, individual, employer, insurance exchanges, Medicaid, all of this comes into effect January 1 in 2014, less than one year from now. So stay tuned because you're going to hear a lot this summer and this fall about where and how to get your coverage. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, why don't we start, uh, first of all, let me thank you both for your excellent uh, presentations and, of course, for your kind words. Uh, why don't we start with uh, the things that keep you up at night and what changes you think we should make right away? And also, uh, for both of you, whether you think the politics is there to make some changes, because whatever changes we made, it would have to be a bipartisan. Right. And uh, I remember large legislation. We used to go in with technical changes that weren't really technical changes. They'd sort of snap through because we had bipartisan agreement. So um, Karen, why don't you start and, and talk about, in addition to the one you mentioned, what changes you would make. I, I'm really sad that you asked, you framed it from the perspective of what keeps you up at night. Yeah. <laughs> I don't sleep very well. <laughs> That's the first thing. Um, I, I think you're, the question of how, and I think Chris and Mark took a shot at this as well, I think there's a combination of things. Clearly, given the difficulty of moving things on Capitol Hill right now, mm -hmm. just to be very direct about it, um, I think that one needs to look at this from the standpoint of how do you make year one and year two work? How do you minimize disruption? How do you improve affordability? And I think that there is a significant amount of authority, regulatory authority, for the regulators to act sensibly, and I think they are working very hard to do that, um, to try to balance all the factors. And I realize our prism isn't necessarily the prism of everyone else's, but I do think that they're working very hard to balance factors. So a couple of things, that ratio I talked about. And the reason we're so focused on that in particular is that we need to get the lesson of what happened in the states. The markets erupted and blew up if when they passed insurance reforms and they didn't have everybody participate. So we don't want to repeat that. So we don't want to be doomed to repeat that. That's why we're focusing now on what can be done to avoid that. So I'd keep that ratio at five to one for at least two years, number one. Number two, I would look at additional transition uh, provisions that can be leveraged to, again, move small employers that have, may have very skinny benefits right now to help them not necessarily in one fell swoop get to the 10 categories and the levels of deductibles and coinsurance. And I think the regulars have been very thoughtful in thinking this out as well so far. But I would do some additional things to just make and that's it very important because it starts to improve the lousy insurance now yeah, out there. Right. We talk about coverage for new insurance, but we forget about the lousy insurance well, out there. On that point, just to digress for a sec, from the standpoint of a small employer, I've been around talking to a number of them now over the last several years. And generally what you hear is, I might like to do more. I'm not able to financially, but I want to do something. Mm -hmm. So it's all in the eye of the beholder. So your right. so-called characterization of where they may be from a small employer perspective who's trying to do the right thing and do something. Mm -hmm. So what I, I'm focused on is how do we get that person into the system so they're not incentivized to drop. Right. So I think there are some additional provisions there. And then there's the premium tax. And I, I want to characterize it from a standpoint of what makes sense and what doesn't and unintended consequences. When small employers, individuals, the premium tax is only on the insured market. So it's the individuals buying coverage, small employers buying coverage, Medicare Advantage. When Medicare Advantage, when seniors realize that $20 to $25 per member per month is going to a tax and not to their benefits, it's going to make a material difference in their benefits, we're going to hear from seniors, and we should. That doesn't make any sense. Medicaid. States that are turning to health plans to help them manage Medicaid, to do it for the dual, duly eligible, they have to pay a tax. It doesn't make any sense. So it's the government paying a tax to government. It doesn't make any sense. So I'm hoping, Donna, that that's one where the others, I think there, there's room on the regulatory side. And I think on the other side, without a doubt, it's hard. But I think it should be looked at from the standpoint of how do we get people into the system you know, and how do you do it in a way that year one and year two can work? Because that's going to be the test here. And so I'm very focused on getting people in and making it as affordable as possible so they can be in. Mm -hmm. Good. Anne. 
Well, what keeps me up at night is generally my four-year-old, but <laughs> after that, um, second to that, um, what keeps me up at night, and I'm always happy to say I'll give anyone my, my view on the, the law, whether it's, you know, I call them the personal, political, policy, or professional, there's lots of views on this law. What really keeps me up at night is I believe in the private sector engine. I believe in employer coverage. I think it has been tremendous in this country for cert to really push forward innovation in our healthcare system and our health benefits. I like the balance between the private sector and Medicare and Medicaid. I think that is a great balance to keep in this country between our federal programs and our private programs. So what I try to do and what, I, what keeps me up at night really when I do wake up at four in the morning is how do we keep employers in the game and how do we keep them, their employees happy and a productive workforce? Um, so I will answer the question. If I were, if I could go into this big, great, big law um, from this side of it, from the employer side of it, and change two words, I would change that full-time equivalent definition to a full-time employee definition to allow small employers better able to plan. I can plan for my full-time population. I can plan when I want to become a larger employer, and I can grow, and I can hire those, you know, employee number 51, and I can still work with my part-time and seasonals to manage my stores, but I can plan better. One word change. The second word I would change is I would strike 30 and I would put in something, even 32, 34, 35. Something that provides a little more of a balance and incentive for employers to offer coverage and for employees to have higher wages. I'm very, very worried about what it's gonna do to this country and the growth of part-time populations of, in this country of, of leased workers, of staff. I, I think there's a real concern here about what it's gonna do to our workforce. Those are the two changes I would make. I don't know if we'll get them done this year or not. Um, we are living in such a tense time in Washington uh, in 2013 and in 2014, but there are rumblings around we need to do some things before 2014 to make sure we get off to a smooth start. Mm -hmm. Let me push you a little on the part-time employees because in some ways the Affordable Care Act is focused on low-income workers, people that get up every day and go to work. Mm -hmm. And many of them, and increasingly, the market without health care reform has been keeping people uh, to part-time. So we've got large numbers of people now in this country that have more than one part-time job. Yes. Some of them are my students. Right. So I'm concerned that we need a design then for them to have health insurance. I agree. So it's one thing to say, you know, change that 30 number, but then we have to make sure that they have access to affordable health insurance an appropriate subsidy. So you are 100% right. I, I could not agree with you more. There needs to be encouragement for employers to offer coverage to part-time workers as well mm -hmm. as their full-time workers. Because the danger is, if you're a part-time worker, you may work 20 hours at one place and 20 hours at another. So neither employer will have to offer you coverage, but your household income might end up being high enough that you cannot get a credit or a subsidy in exchange. And so you're sort of like, well, I can't go here and I can't go here. That is not a good outcome. Mm -hmm. I actually agree, I agree with you wholeheartedly that we should have more policy proposals developed for, as, if we get to that point to be able to allow people to offer to part-time, even if maybe it's not as generous or that they can go into an exchange with some assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to talk about looking under the hood, Karen, a little bit because um, we really haven't get, gotten to a full board discussion about the cost of health care. Right. And we've got hospitals out here and doctors, and you made the point that we're a little afraid to, because we're gonna, someone's ox is gonna be gored in the process. And unless there's a political process right. in which we share the pain, because you're really talking about the whole system coming down, and right now we're cross-subsidizing it in some ways. How do we put that together? I mean, we've got doctors and nurses and hospitals out here, and they've suspected for a long time that this is eventually going to get to less income, um, lowering your costs. But at the end of the day, it means less income to individuals, less employment in a very dynamic, what has been a dynamic uh, industry, less personnel. And some of us have suffered from this already. We've had to pull down some of our overhead costs because of the impact of the economy. So talk about that a little and about the process of getting through that because in many ways it could be led by the private sector but unless those large public sector programs come along right. I mean welcome to high reimbursement South Florida because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well, you're talking directly mm -hmm. to us when you start lifting up the hood well I think you put your finger on the Gordian knot of health care 
that nobody really wants to talk about, and it quickly clears a crowded room on Capitol Hill. And that is to say that if you look at the new job growth over the last few years, much of it, a substantial amount of it is in healthcare. So we're building on a system that we cannot sustain. Now the question is, how do you deal with that? And you can't take a two by four approach to it, obviously, because that doesn't work and makes no sense and we've got to have a rational process. So where do you have the rational process? I think quite a lot of what we've thought about in the policy community for a very long time is wrong. And let me give you an example of that. Back, um, we were very much involved in a coalition two years ago, two and a half years ago now, that tried to identify ways to take two trillion out of the cost of health care. Given what we're going to be spending over the next t 10 years in four tranches, Medicare, Medicaid, subsidies, and tax expenditures, which is what the government subsidizes, Chris and Mark were talking about in terms of purchase of insurance, we're going to be spending $17 trillion. Tell me we can't take one to two off that, over 10. Not tomorrow, but over 10. Then the question is, what's the pathway to that? Here's where I think the policy discussion has mis been misdirected. I think we've tried to have these discussions at the federal level. The truth of the matter is we have to look at getting in under the hood. We have to look at what is, the, what is going on in the various venues around the country with respect to the public health challenges, number one. Miami has led in the discussion about public health challenges. What is the situation in terms of wide variation in practice patterns? You can't do that at the national level. You've got to look locally at that. How do we think about a 21st century workforce? How do we think about, and you know, it's an anathema in some circles to talk about changing scope of practice rules. That can't be done at the federal level. It has to be done at the state level. Mm -hmm. And we've primarily had the discussion from the standpoint of nurses, et cetera, working to the top of their license. I think about it as physicians working to the top of their license. Because to the extent we can get more help to physicians from nurses, PAs, and others in the healthcare space, that will allow us to do more with the physicians we have. And I think, so I think that is a local discussion as well. Again, just to deal with a sacred cow, building and construction. Every hospital, large hospital in this country, is on a building and construction boom. We cannot sustain the overhead. We just can't. And now the question is, what do you do about that? Where are the incentives? What about consolidation? Can't look at that at the national level. You've got to look at it at the state level, local level. So I think, Donna, the incentives need to be um, uh, at the state level. I don't mean the states acting unilaterally but at gathering the stakeholders together to look at the data, number one, to look at the problems at that particular state level and to think about solutions. And the, the thought that we've had about this is that if you go back to that 17 trillion that we're gonna be spending nationally and you think about, well, if that's what CBO, just to get technical in the baseline has projected, to the extent you bend that cost curve, there's money on paper to do gain sharing and to reward states for doing it. You also have the ability to look at total costs, not just Medicare, Medicaid, we have to get out, out of this silo effect. So you've asked a very, I think, important question, and I think, um, I hope um, I, I've given you an answer that reflects the seriousness of your question. I just think that we've gotta go back to some fundamental principles. What's the problem? Where is the best way to solve the problem? It's a little like a mathematical equation or it's a chemistry problem or a physics problem as you, got, you all think about those kinds of issues here at the university. We need to start thinking what is the right level to have this discussion and how do we incent it at the federal level? And you're really talking about a fundamental reorganization, though, about how we deliver health care at the same time. If you're talking yeah. about scope of practice changes Absolutely. and people working up to their uh, level, you're talking about organizing care in the delivery system yes. in a different way. And what about individual responsibility? One of the great things about having an academic health center is that um, I have a doctor for every part of my body. <laughs> so I twist my ankle. I, this is a true story. I twist my ankle and I go to the ankle guy. And a very nice, young, untenured assistant uh, professor. And he looks at my ankle and he says, you know, it's probably twisted. He said, but I think you ought to have an MRI. And I said, MRI, won't an x-ray do? And uh, he looked at me and he said, but most people want an MRI. I said, yeah, but I know the difference in cost between the x-ray and the MRI. And besides, the x-ray is down the hall and I can have it in two minutes. Right. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, he turned kind of white. I'm sure he thought he would never get tenure, you know, <laughs> at the place. The point is that uh, the consciousness of individuals, and why don't you talk a little about this issue and how we're going to handle the politics of everybody. We're essentially talking about less people working in the industry, perhaps, or being organized different in ways. different ways, and, and no anticipation of the kind of salaries that we right. may have had in the past. But also, this has to be accompanied by regulatory reform, I'm certain that you yes. would say. Yes. Because we're spending a lot of money on the regulation side. We are. A lot of this now, because of the statute being on the books, is, is done through the regulatory side. And by that we mean, you know, we spend a lot of time in Washington talking to um, the, you know, President Obama's administration, Health and Human Services, where, where you were um, as Secretary, uh, Treasury and the IRS and the Department of Labor. These are all the regulators that are putting out the rules. And I will say to your point about how does this affect the individual or the employee, um, depending on what system you're in, is it's going to be very complicated um, for individuals and employees in this country come this summer. Like we said, when the media starts going and, and we're get, trying to get up and running by the fall in October, because the idea here for an individual is that A, you're supposed to have coverage. Unless you want to face a tax penalty, you are required to have coverage. And the trick for an individual is going to be figuring out where, what is my right, where should I be? What is the right coverage for me? Um, and it is largely based on income. So, you know, can I go to an exchange? Am I eligible for a credit or subsidy? Should I be on Medicaid? You know, can I get it through my employer? Will my spouse get it? Will my children receive coverage there? It's very complicated and very technical uh, in terms of based on your income and where you and your family can get coverage. And I think we're going to all have to do, and all of us that, you know, here today that work in the healthcare sector, whether it's insurance or Medicare, Medicaid, or the employer sector, really have to think about it from the individual's point of view. Where do I go? Where do I get coverage? How do I pay for it? Um, I think it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a real challenge in the next six to nine months before we get off the ground. Karen? Just to come behind, Anne, um, I think the question that you posed is a very interesting one from two perspectives. One, um, and I think Anne gave a very thoughtful answer, again, just to supplement. I think that we need to think about the issue of malpractice reform. And largely, the discussion has been uh, focused on tort reform. I think we need to focus it on how, if we want to have best practice, we need to reward and protect physicians and hospitals that are practicing best practice. And that means, in the case of malpractice, all of the incentives for the physicians and the hospitals are to do everything possible because they need to protect themselves. It's quite logical. Again, it's just like fee-for-service, body part by body part, quite logical what the incentives are. We have to do, we have to change that. We have to change the current malpractice structure and protect doctors that are practicing best practice. The other thing, Donna, that occurred to me when you posed And that, that has to be done state by state, though. Yeah. We don't have a, a federal angle, well, you uh, could even with some subsidies you, to try some new things. Yeah, I think that um, the reality is the best reform will be done with thoughtful people coming together to say, in a particular area, we have wide variation in practice. How do you actually get best practice? What are the standards that we use? And I think there's been a lot of discussion about that nationally as well as state by state. Mark talked about this, and I think um, very compellingly. So I think that that's part of it. But the other issue that we Because right now, standard of care does not protect you. Yes, exactly. And I think that that is a major shortfall. I'm a Democrat consumer. that believes in tort reform, by the way. So. But, con but consumers yeah. should be worried about that, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Consumers should be worried. And the other thing consumers should be worried about, and you hear this very rarely in the discussion, how much radiation are we all being exposed to? And there's only now some beginning studies about the fact is that we're paying significant, I think, health care consequences associated with these incentives which are to do everything possible. And so I, I think we're at the bottom end of the understanding about all that, but that's part of it from a patient perspective. And if I could just add another word, I think um, when it comes to sort of the individual experience, it come you know this fall and into next year, which is where should I get my coverage and how much is it gonna cost? The very next question as we look at these 32 million uninsured Americans that are coming into the system is will I have a provider to be there and take care of me because all of this, the systems and the reimbursements and the incentives are being realigned. And a lot of this 32 million are gonna need basic care, primary care, have never been in to have you know, the, the diabetes check or you know, their blood pressure checked. A lot of this is gonna be basic primary care. 
are we going to have enough providers? Um, and in what systems are they going to be in? Medicaid, you know, the insurance exchanges, the plans. Will we have enough providers and, and facilities for them to go? Well, that goes back to Karen's point, though. Unless we're prepared to take on the scope of practice issue so that everybody works up to their, right. up to their standards, level. we actually have enough providers if, if we can expand the scope of practice mm -hmm. um, uh, for everyone mm -hmm. and, and use doctors appropriately for their training right. and nurses right. and advanced practice nurses and physicians assistants and all the other people that we've been training and, in the healthcare system. And what a system. wonderful employment training agenda. Right. You know, mm -hmm. As we think about from the standpoint of the new economy in this country, increasing productivity, what better way to really start thinking about all of these issues that we really rarely talk about when right. it comes to healthcare. Let's go to some questions. Um, let's, uh, the microphones are set up and we'd be uh, happy to have our colleagues here answer some questions. Hard to see. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. I'm Rolly Mupala. I'm one of the interventional cardiologists from Fort Myers, Florida. The question I have is, you know, you always talk about affordability, availability, and access. I think you, you answered a couple of questions there. Affordability, I think, you know, uh, the, the Affordable Care Act is going to provide uh, all the insurance requirements with Obamacare, everything. That's going to roll in another 38 million people to the uh, uh, people who will be using healthcare services. But access itself, you know, right now, you know, in this, in this state, it's so difficult to get to a primary care physician. It takes three to four months for me to see a primary care physician. And we always have, you know, we want to have a good quality providers. At the same time, if you want to send your kids to med schools, it's costing us fifty to $60,000 a year, and we're going to get to almost like, you know, one-fourth of a million in loan or debt for yeah. these kids, I think and you'll be talking about well. uh, reducing payments for everyone. How are these kids are going to you know, feel that they want to go to med school, provide a good quality of care, at the same time pay up their bills? Go ahead. I, I think you have put your finger on um, one of the most important infrastructure issues that rarely gets talked about. I, I went to college on scholarship. I wouldn't have gone to college otherwise, so I'm very grateful to have done that. My husband did too. And when you pose the question of how do middle class kids ever think about going to medical school, is that option being closed off because the amount of debt they come in w out with is just going to be um, uh, just impossible to manage. I think that's something that we really, I always thought in healthcare reform, and there seemed to be little appetite for it at the time. I always thought we should be looking at that. Again, what incentives do you How put you? in place? How do you get scholarships aligned with needs? Um, how do you think about uh, making sure that these careers stay open to the best and the brightest, which is going to need some, mean some financial subsidies? I'm, so that's why I'm thinking as we think about turning these discussions down closer to the ground, to the delivery system, to the educational system, getting stakeholders involved. I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna, but I think that there you can identify pathways and opportunities. Um, the business community has a strong interest in that, and I'm sure would want to talk about that, as well as the education community and the entire stakeholder community. Mm -hmm. I think this is impossible, almost, to do at, at a level at Washington because you're not that close to the ground. So I hope you continue to raise these issues and we can actually do something that could incentivize this kind of local discussion, dialogue, and ultimately action. Okay. Thank you. Um, All right. Chris, questions so that we can uh, give our uh, colleagues here an, an opportunity to answer the more direct questions. Direct us to, to Karen. I'm Dr. Nord. I'm a spine surgeon here in Miami, solo practice. You mentioned something about the cost and everything in there, uh, the charges and all this. Medicare, by default, has become the reimbursement standard over the last 25 years. In 1985, a heart surgeon would get $5,000 to replace the valve. Now he gets $1,000, and 75% of those residencies have been filled. I think somehow or other the doctor has been pushed aside as the deliverer of health care. It's not the insurance company. It's not the hospital. And there needs to be more transparency. Uh, What's the question? The question is, is how do you think we can change that? Because 
Nine out of 10 people in the United States get their health care from a solo or small group practitioner, and that's mm -hmm. via the New England Journal about two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. So go to the ACOs and doing all this other stuff. I don't know how that's going to really change reimbursements. You all as insurance uh, representatives are concerned about the high cost that they're going to charge. Well, economic sustainability for private practice doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is how do you rectify this lowball re, uh, reimbursement because it's going to end up in a manpower shortage. You're not going to have the doctors right. doing it mm -hmm. anymore. Right. Um, two things. One, uh, the study we released today is about out-of-network charges, and I wouldn't have mentioned it if we hadn't, if we had seen something, you know, in the neighborhood of uh, close to uh, a benchmark. But we're seeing some out-of-network charges 95% times Medicare. Um, and we, we dealt with, we eliminated the worst outliers. So for certain specialty ser services around the country. Um, so that, that is a, a clearly a problem that everybody has a stake in solving. To the physician problem that you were talking about, I agree with you. I think that the way, and what we're seeing health plans do around the country, which is really exciting, and here in Florida, making sure that as we partner with physicians, we're helping physicians with coordination of care. Not expecting the physicians to do that alone in their practice, yet another thing, but giving them the resources, and uh, whether it be nurse practitioners and, or others, other prof professionals to help do triage, help do follow-up. I'm in a disease okay. management program, I have asthma. My plan's always you know, calling me, you haven't filled your medication, you're gonna end up in the emergency room. That's just one example of the kind of thing that goes on. But making sure that we're partnering with you as a physician to extend your reach. And I think um, now with the new reimbursement mechanisms, moving away from the retrospective system to a more prospective medical homes, bundling and so on, I think physicians can be more satisfied with that and work in partnership with health plans, not just on the cost side, but on the quality side, and that's what patients want as well. You know, what people don't understand is, is eight times Medicare now would equal what we got in 1985. Yeah, but uh, the people new- people go to school yeah. hoping- okay. yeah. Oh, I'll give you, oh. okay, I'll give you eight. And my point is, is where, I don't think is anybody understands that. That's well, my point. Well, but we do understand it. Uh, um, he's, he's really complaining that the, that the payment for that particular procedure is going down, that's based, as you well know, on the AMA running a system based on actual costs, which sets a price for Medicare. Yeah, um, yeah we shouldn't have this piece rate system. And, and because problem. we have a piece system, which is Karen's uh, talking about, you get caught up in that, and solo practitioners, because they don't have the same kind of volume and range, um, are, I mean, there's no way they can survive under the current uh, fee-for-service system. U ultimately, they've ultimately either got to be part of something larger or they've got to be part of a new system that pays well, them in a different way. This is what's really interesting, seeing health plans making sure that they can help physicians who want to stay in their offices exactly. as single practitioners or with a, uh, one other practitioner. By taking off them, some of the overhead costs yeah, as part of it. And also giving them support in terms of coordinated care so the physicians right. don't have to do all of that themselves. Right. We just need it's to ensure medical business. care for uh, everybody. Well, That's the whole point. Well, I think point. we'll take the next question. Thank you. It's a Hi, very I'm, important point, though. Hi, my name is Artie Salo. I'm an exercise physiology major. And uh, one of the questions that I had, we seem to be talking a lot about prevention and wellness in a very vague manner. And we also seem to talk about it only from the perspective of stopping a disease that's already happened from progressing into a catastrophic disease. What are the incentives to prevent these diseases from happening in the first place when we're dealing with diabetes, high cholesterol, things like that? I know we have some incentives in the way of exercise programs, but it seems like the I food policy, the, the subsidies that we're providing in that are actually making us sicker. Yeah. Absolutely, I mean, I'll just say briefly that one, and one of the points you may have heard me discuss was the fact that, particularly in the empl employer system, where the employ employers have spent a lot of time thinking about wellness, not just from, certainly because if I have, if, if I'm working with a lot of, um, let's say I run an auto parts shop and I have a lot of older men, or let's say I do run a hair cuttery and I have a lot of young, you know, single female workers, being able to design a benefit package that works for the population you have is incredibly important. 
And when, when employers look at wellness, I think they do have a broad understanding of it. It isn't just about preventing cancer or diabetes or you know, heart disease, but it is also about you know, are you um, exercising? Are you keep maintaining your weight? Are you, you know, reducing smoking and use of tobacco products? I think they've looked at the whole sort of panoply of issues that makes a healthy person. So um, that's the sort of innovation that I hope st continues. There are incentives under the Affordable Care Act to do those types of wellness right. programs. It's sort of built in without going into the t technical details of the statute into some of those affordability issues and, and benefit designs. And I personally hope it continues and it's part of the sort of consumer directed movement. Yeah. And if you, uh, we've talked a little about Senator Daschle's leadership of the Bipartisan Policy Council. There actually is a new report out on exactly that uh, subject and what employers are doing around the country. And that's worth looking at. Uh, yes, good morning. First, I wanted to congratulate all the women in the panel. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> uh, also, I have, I think everything is related to the elephant in the room that was only briefly mentioned, and is the uh, lawsuits and uh, the reforms. You know, a lot of physicians have uh, a pressure to perform um, procedures that Sometimes we don't even agree, but we're forced by the family members and the patients demanding it. And you feel like you have to do it just because, you know, otherwise you'll be sued. And then everything you've worked for very hard will be gone. And nobody seems to be, you know, worried about that. I understand the uh, expansion of the scope of practice, but at the end of the day, the physician is the one that gets sued and everybody else gets a free right. And that's wrong. That's completely that wrong. Right. Yeah, and the states have taken up this issue around the country. That's a very good point. The states have taken up uh, the issue um, around the country. Um, but again, I don't, I guess we haven't found a way for the feds to intervene in that issue because of the constitutional questions. It's just, um, it, it's- Very um, much a state issue. Well, and also I think it's hard right now in Washington um, to move to policy discussions. And I think we need to prioritize this. There have been efforts to begin to get some traction on these kinds of reforms. And I think this is one of the most important well, things we can do. The patient safety movement has driven down mm -hmm. the number of lawsuits um, in this country. It's really had an impact uh, done correctly. Uh, physicians, nurses, the healthcare industry has taken it seriously. Mm -hmm. And that certainly um, has to be part of the overall package. And of course, the feds have incentivized that. Yeah, I, I think um, though it's been difficult politically to take the next step and we need to, I think the person who raised the question is absolutely right. From the standpoint of being a physician today, you're worried. Um, all of us have friends who were wonderfully trained, but don't feel they're frightened to be OBGYNs now. And, and or, or neurosurgeons. Yes, yeah, so you can go right down the specialty um, uh, level and ladder. And we, I think we need to confront that sooner rather than later. And we're kidding ourselves if we don't. If we want to have a safe system that practices best practice, then we have to align the incentives to achieve that. In, in some ways, we're giving the governors a list of things to do in addition to whether they're going to put the exchanges up on other things. They've got to see this as part of a, a larger strategy. I think they're in a tremendous position to bring stakeholders together, and it's very hard to walk away from governors. Yeah. And do you talk to governors at all? I do. About the Affordable Care Act? Yes. Are they implement, are, are, have you been talking to some people that are thinking, you know, I'm just not go I'm going to let the feds come in with the exchanges? Yes. And what are you saying to them? Okay. So. This is a setup because our governor is trying to figure out whether he's going to do the exchanges or not I'm aware in our of legislature. That. So, and that's a good point. So, so, in terms of what the statute authorized and for the states to move forward on these insurance exchanges, they're all in different places. Yeah. Some are moving ahead aggressively and early and are getting underway. Uh, some are still making decisions, not sure whether they're going to, to do the exchange or not. Um, and others have flat out said. And no. why would they not? Uh, do the exchanges, why would they turn over ownership to the feds? Well, I think that's going to be an interesting question. I mean, some of it is um, when they're looking at whether or not to establish these exchanges, you know, in, in doing the exchange coupled with the Medicaid expansion. Um, certainly, there's no question there's some political issues going on, but it also for every governor is a, is a major budget issue. 
you know, establishing these exchanges and the infrastructure that it takes, expanding the Medicaid program. There is a great deal of federal support for that, but it will be, it is a long-term issue for them. So some of them, it's a variety of what does my state look like? What does my uninsured population look like? How heavy of a burden is this gonna be? I mean, one thing that I think is not often talked about is it's not like the uninsured are equally distributed across the country. You know, they are concentrated in Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, you know, when everyone talks about the Massachusetts ex uh, connector and exchange, our first experiment, or there's Utah has an exchange. Well, there was very few uninsured, not to the level in Massachusetts, not to the levels that there are here like in Florida or Texas. So a lot of them are looking at it from, from a budget point of view. What does it mean to expand Medicaid and, ex and do the exchanges? The one thing though that I think will prompt some governors to step in and establish an insurance exchange is because they won't necessarily want the federal government to come in and do consistent, consistent ideology. ideology <laughs> in that the business of insurance has always been at the state level. And I know the, the Florida Blues would talk about this and that the business of insurance has always been at the state level. It is a state run local mm -hmm. enterprise. I'm mm -hmm. sure Karen, you would agree with this. And we will, there's a lot of good reason for having it financed and delivered at the local level. I think at some point, and you were a former secretary, you know, if you had to come in and, and federally facilitate 35 states, that's a very tall task for Washington to take on. Yep. So it, it remains to be seen, but there's a lot of political and budget issues. But eventually, I think the states are going to want to run their own insurance programs. I, Donna, just one yep. postscript. I think it was a very smart decision that the regulators made to create this middle uh, state partnership. Of partnership so that you can scale up. Uh, as you're ready, right? So it's not either or. I thought that was mm -hmm. a very well. I think they decision. listened to the states. Yep. It sounds like they. Li I wasn't yep. in the discussion, obviously. Yep. It sounds like they listened to the states, yep. states that really wanted to get there but couldn't get there initially. And what's right. the one word governors always use? One word: flexibility. Yeah. Flexibility. Well, flexibility. they actually <laughs> use the word. Uh, you know, block grants, send me the money, send no me regulations. <laughs> Show me the money. Get off our backs. <laughs> yes, back there. Good morning, uh, Ann Lynn Danker, Florida Board of Nursing and the Florida Action Coalition mm -hmm. that is working to implement the Institute of Medicine uh, recommendations on the future of nursing. Um, so sure. scope of practice, um, there is a war on nurses um, and uh, is there ever a possibility that through the Affordable Care Act or federal legislation or rules that the scope of practice could be equalized throughout the country. Licensing is at the state level. Yeah, licensing is simply at the state level. There are some things that CMS can do. I actually know the technical answer to this, uh, that they're in the process of reviewing or doing, including putting nurses on panels. Right. And they're actually, there are some things the private insurance companies yes. could do, and many of the, they are many of, the uh, of your companies have already done yes. this. So we are seeing some movement uh, in, this, mm -hmm. in this area. Right, yeah. and, and I do think there are things that can be done at the federal level in terms of not necessarily scope of practice, but all licensure, but you know, reimbursement. And you know, the other reason why, and I, I hope you don't always feel that there's a, a, a war on, on nurses, you know, the other thing that's often not talked about with respect to the Affordable Care Act is we often talk about, and you heard me talk about the 32 million that are coming in, but it doesn't solve all of our country's problems. There are still going to be millions of uninsured in this country, even in this town. In this town, even no. if the law works perfectly, there will still be millions of uninsured and uncompensated care. And so, the ability for them to get coverage and the need for emergency care and urgent care, all of that is still going to exist. And I don't know that that is always. And I know that's a big concern for the hospitals in the room as we talk about uncompensated care and bad debt and who, where are the providers. I, I still think we have a lot of issues to address. Thank uh, you. Th this year, the um, Florida legislature um, and the organized medicine has um, actually escalated their fight against nurses having um, the ability to uh, practice to well, the full extent. Well, there are more of you than there are of them, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, John Hirsch. Uh, I um, am not a medical doctor, but I work with them. And uh, in listening to the seminar so far, I've heard a clear uh, uh, motivation of movement away from uh, fee-for-service payment, and I understand that. And um, from what I've seen in working with medical doctors, there are, is an obvious issue associated with that, which is uh, there's a motivation to work hard. The more you do, the more you get. Yes, I'll take that call at 7 p.m. on Friday night. And so 
if that uh, compensation structure has changed, there's a motivational change. And that's probably old news to you, something you all have been thinking about. Mm -hmm. There's a second subtle aspect to it that I think uh, warrants some discussion, and that is that innovation in medicine takes place both in academic institutions and out in private practice with people tinkering. Because if they tinker and they get an innovation that gives them a competitive advantage, their practice will be rewarded. Let me give you a very simple 30-second example uh, coming from ophthalmology. It used to be that with a cataract operation, it was common to have the eye perforated in the course of the procedure and a stitch subsequently in a patch. Well, ophthalmologists out there in private practice tinkering figured out that if rather than make a, making a puncture wound, you made more of a slicing wound, that the interocular pressure of the eye would close the wound, therefore you don't need a stitch and you don't need a patch. And people who figured that out soonest and had cataract patients out in their local market talking them up sooner financially benefited from that. So my point is, is that innovation comes from both academic settings and private practice. And if we take away that incentive. If I come up with an innovation, sure it'll feel intrinsically good to me, but extrinsically I'll benefit as well. Then theoretically you have a diminution in the rate and progression of technology uh, and improvements coming from the private sector. And I just think it's worth to. I, I think that point's very well made. And it, in fact, at the next panel, they're gonna be talking about the transformation. And I think specifically, um, I think all of us think going from fee-for-service to this brave new world is harder than anyone's oh, admitting yeah. out there. But let's leave that uh, uh, issue to the next panel. I'm told I have to cut this off. You I bet. apologize to those of you that want to ask questions. But these two very distinguished panelists who have come a long way uh, to be with us today, let me thank uh, Karen thank you. and thank you. Anne. Thank you. Thank you.